-hmm. So my recommendation to an organization that is trying to evolve culture and trying to make lean thinking really stick, start talking about leadership, team dynamics, personal values, those kinds of issues, and I think you're gonna add a lot of power to your lean efforts. Welcome to the Just In Time Cafe, Go Lean Six Sigma.com's official podcast, where we help you build your problem solving muscles. We share best practices from over 20 years of success, helping organizations from the Fortune 500 to small and medium sized business to government achieve their goals using Lean Six Sigma. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey, Tracy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. It's really busy in here today. It's so loud. Where'd all these people come from? I know. This place is getting way too popular. I know. It's probably because they heard about our Just In Time Cafe. <laughs> They're coming to hear us, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's get some coffee and head into the private dining room. I'm right behind you. Hi everyone, welcome to the Just In Time Cafe. I'm Tracy O'Rourke and this is Elizabeth Swan and we are your hosts. So Elizabeth, what is on the menu today? I'm so glad you wanna hear the menu, Tracy. Let's look. Today's appetizer, we've got an app that gives PowerPoint a facelift. And then on today's bulletin board, we're gonna find out how the city of El Paso is going to show us the way. And we'll find out why Going Six Sigma is in the news. I hope it's not the police report. <laughs> For Tools of the Trade, we're going to cover Patrick Lencioni's new book. He's most famous for the five dysfunctions of a team. But this new one covers the three virtues of a great team player. For today's special request, we've got a question from a subscriber that uncovers a lean battle for the acronyms. And then today's special, Tracy, your interview with a lean veteran to address the concept of intentional culture. I'm dying to find out about that. Yes. We got a good lineup today. We do. Let's get to the appetizer. Okay, Tracy, what is this app that gives PowerPoint a facelift? So this app is actually something that I've used quite a lot in the past. It's called slidemodel.com. And if you're running out of time to develop a slide presentation in PowerPoint, but you want high quality, professionally designed slides, this website is for you. So they have ready-made PowerPoint templates, shapes, designs, and diagrams but they're not just the standard kinds of PowerPoint templates that come in PowerPoint. These are super cool, way awesome types of designs. <laughs> they have so many searchable categories like for business or strategy or marketing or SWOT templates. You could even search by shape or you know, put in a, t a, a type that you want like a thermometer graph as an example and it'll pull up any slides that have a thermometer graph what's really cool is they've got a lot of ready-made templates for lean and six sigma and demaic already and so it's important to note that these are not jpegs they're not pictures of things that you insert in powerpoint they're actually powerpoint slides and you can move the shapes, you can change the colors, you can arrange or rearrange the design however you want. So there's a lot of flexibility in using the slides as well. So a couple of benefits that I want to mention um, is that it saves hours of work because they're downloadable and they're ready-made slides. The, the designs are very professional, very sharp looking, very flexible. And again, like I had said, you can adjust the colors, the sizes, the shapes, the text. You can insert your own logos, those kinds of things. And how many designs do you think they have? Well, about 12,000 designs <laughs> that you could actually choose from. So there's a lot to, to, to see. I love going in there just seeing what they come up with. It's like shopping for really cool looking slides. And I know you love shopping, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> So actually for, for me, this was a huge discovery of how you have such fun presentations. It's like, this is, this is a great like insight into that your criteria were things that were way cool and awesome. So 
Thank you for turning me on to your secret weapon. And then the other thing I just want to tell folks that want to go take a look at Slide Model, they had a lot of different subscription options. You could just do one day. You could do yearly. You could do it with a group up to five people being able to download. And they give you so many images per month. So just based on your what you think your user level would be, they seem pretty flexible on how you can use them. So I think it's a pretty cool app. Good. I'm glad you like it. And I think a lot of people... If you have to do presentations, you're going to get, you're going to really like this. I'm with you. Hey, up next, let's go to the bulletin board. So Elizabeth, how is El Paso showing us the way? I'm glad you asked. This is a double entendre I'm giving you because El Paso, I figured out, actually means the way or the path, which is kind of cool as the name of your city, you know, because for me, it was always a big discovery. Like I remember finding out that pesto, which, you know, from where I am, that's like this incredible basil pine nut thing that you grow up revering that it just meant paste. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Pesto (laughs) just means paste. But in this case, El Paso means the way. And I thought that was really cool. They're, they were basically working to show us the way to keep streets safer. If you've ever felt the jolt of hitting a pothole and then wondering, what did that just do to your car? Then you want your town to follow their example, to follow the way. El Paso, which has about 180,000, I mean, excuse me, 80, 860,000 residents, so bigger than Boston, which is uh, 650,000, something like that. They're using Lean Six Sigma to improve city government processes, something near and dear to both our hearts. In this case, they studied the process to fill potholes, and they found that by assigning crews to a smaller geographic area, they drove down the drive time, and they drove up the number of potholes they could address in a shorter time period. So they can now fill 500 holes a week versus 300 a week in 2016, and I want that in my town. Uh, The other cool related topic is the city of Louisville, they were also using Lean Six Sigma to clean up the pothole process. And they came up with a report a pothole hotline and they reduced the cycle time to fill. And then they upgraded the equipment to better press asphalt into place. So they really tackled stuff like that. They have a whole dashboard called Louisstat. It's totally public. You can go look up how they're doing it, you know, responding to police calls, things like that. So very encouraging to see these cities grabbing process improvement to serve their populations. I love it. I love it too. And I will say that I have a whole new appreciation for potholes that do not exist because I was on a road that was in desperate need of repair and it was so bad that I had to turn around and go back because I could not (laughs) handle the ride. I was not in a Jeep. (laughs) And yeah. so I really appreciate that. And you were that, not, that. and you were, you were not in El Paso. <laughs> I was not in El Paso. I was, I was actually on a volcano. <laughs> wow! And a jeep didn't even help you. So Tracy, tell me, how did Golene Six Sigma end up in the news? Well, I am honored and proud to say that my news article for this month is on GoLeanSixSigma.com. <laughs> I'm so excited. We're in the news. So we are recognized as one of Hawaii's fastest growing small businesses in the Pacific Business News. They're having their 23rd annual Hawaii's Fastest 50, and GoLeanSixSigma.com is, is on the list again this year. So that is super exciting. Last year, we also were on the list, and you basically go to this event, and they don't announce who the fastest growing companies are until you get there. And so we went last year. It was a lot of fun. There was probably about 350 people there, and they just go down the list, you know, the 50th, 40th, and then they get down, and, you know, it was, you know, top 10 left, and we hadn't been called yet. And so it was really exciting. We were the sixth fastest growing company in Hawaii. So that was very exciting. And I think more importantly, why? Because, you know, and here's a free plug here, of course, because we make things easy and accessible. People like our stuff, yellow belt, green belt, black belt, lean training. And we have so much free stuff like this podcast and webinars and blogs. So um, happy to announce that 
a lot of people like us and we're growing. So that's a little bit about us. That's a nice one. I'm glad it wasn't police report, but I just want to say (laughs) last year you got to go to the ceremony. I think this year I need to go to the ceremony, especially since it's in Hawaii. (laughs) This is true. I think you're right. I would love to go as well, but I'll let you go this time. Thank you, Tracy. You're so kind. You're listening to the Just in Time Cafe podcast. I'm Elizabeth Swan. Next up, it is Tools of the Trade. Okay, Elizabeth. So tell us the three key virtues of a great team. Uh, This was a great one, Tracy. I really appreciate this book. It is The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. And our listeners are going to be relieved to know that the three key virtues are the ability to be humble, hungry, and smart. And in case you're wondering about that last one, because you, you know, am I smart or not? It's people smarts. Uh, Most people know about Patrick Lencioni because of his five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, Book's very popular and his books are really useful for us and folks in the process improvement world because We work in teams, and even if not, we need stakeholders and leaders to be good team players, too. And he starts this book with what he calls a fable. And it reminded me of the first person to do that, which is Eli Goldratt, and he popularized that technique with the goal. So he had a novel up front, and in this case, he's got this upfront fable with real people, which works well. They're believable characters. They're nice. The writing style, the sense of humor, he's got a real easy way. It's almost gentleness is what I take from this book. But the people are real. The situations are occasionally funny. And what I like also about when he gets to the model, so the first two thirds are this fable and the last third is about his model. And he points out that humility is most key. And a lot of people would say people smarts. And I like that he went for humility And I I think you know that when you work with someone who is not humble, it's basically the same as his approach with five dysfunctions, like what doesn't work, you know, when you're working with someone who is not. The other thing I really appreciated in that last third of his book is he deals with application. Like how do you hire an ideal team player? How do you assess your current employees as to how ideal a team player they are? How do you develop ideal team players? And then how do you build a culture full of these people? So he offers, again, like us, it's lots of free tools, questionnaires, models, PDFs, and interviewing techniques, assessments, really good stuff and free. So I really appreciate it. I highly recommend this to anybody, really anybody, but particularly if you're trying to work with teams and you want to get a better sense of what it means to be a good team player. Yes, I I actually liked this book as well. This is The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. And I like all of his books. He's written some really good books. I like The Five Dysfunctions of a Team as well. And I like his style of writing. One of the things I really liked about this book, I would absolutely agree with these three qualities. And I think one of my favorite parts of the book was when he goes through scenarios of of a missing quality, right? So you can be hungry and smart, but not humble. And what does that create? A skillful politician. Mm. (laughs) And you know, I guess I have to say, sadly, someone I know (laughs) popped into my head for many of these. Like, oh yeah, I, I I know that kind of a person. Another one, smart and humble, but not hungry, the lovable slacker. Mm. So, of course, you don't want to use these labels with people because that's not really a great way to build a team. No. But but I have to be honest and tell you that I, I actually got a visual of someone I know that does this or that is missing this quality. So I thought that was interesting, too, to really sort of make the association of a missing quality concrete. So that was that was something I really liked about the book. The other thing I liked is that the hungry part. So he he spends time mentioning that 
he, he's talking about the good hunger, right? So he doesn't want people to be so hungry that they don't take care of themselves. That's actually not healthy either. So it's really more of a healthy hungry that it's the type of person that doesn't have to be pushed by a manager. They work harder because they're motivated and they're diligent, but it's not that, you know, they're, they're chained to their desk and they don't take care of themselves and take a break when they should and, and those kinds of things. They still have the importance of values and family and those kinds of things in mind. So I like, I really liked that approach as well. And I think I'm going to use it. I can't imagine hiring anybody now without really thinking through his methods of interviewing. Yes, I agree. I think it's important. Those, those qualities are um, very telling. And, you know, I also thought about people that ended up having to leave out of organizations and, you know, what, why didn't it work or what were they, what, you know, and sometimes it was a quality, one of these qualities that, that, that they didn't have. Mm. Yeah, good to make it obvious and put it out there and more understandable of why you might not fit in a culture. Great book. Highly recommend it. And I loved your review as well, Elizabeth. And I, I would highly recommend reading Elizabeth's review on our website. So you are listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. I'm Tracy O'Rourke. In just a short while, we'll get to hear my interview with Brett Cooper about lean culture. But first, it's a special request. The Q&A from one of our subscribers. So Elizabeth, here's a question for you from one of our subscribers. Why do some online resources refer to seven wastes and use the acronym Tim Wood? This is a great question. And at the heart of the answer is basically, how did you learn it? How did you learn about the seven wastes, the eight wastes? And it reminds me of some of the root causes people get to with the processes they're looking at. And when they ask, why, why do you do it this way? And sometimes they get down to, well, that's the way we've always done it. So this can be the way you've always done it. But what I love is that I learned to remember using Tim Wood. You know, that's transportation, inventory, movement, waiting, overproduction, overprocessing, and defects, right? Tim Wood as a way to remember the seven wastes. But you, Tracy O'Rourke, introduced me to the downtime acronym, And at first, when I got a slide deck from you, I corrected you. And I sent it back saying, (laughs) I don't know where you got this (laughs) downtime acronym, but the the acronym is Tim Wood, my friend. So you might want to correct yourself. So when you talked to me about it, and I finally noticed like, duh, it spells downtime, which is one of the wastes of waiting. I thought, oh, well, this is way too too succinct. It really ties up eight wastes by describing it a waste, and it includes the incredibly important non-utilized talent. You know, there's there's some semantics. You could say over-processing becomes extra-processing. People still get what those means, what those mean. And that some Tim Wood enthusiasts added you, right, as the Tim Wood University, right? Tim Wood U, that gets at the underutilized intellectual capital is another way I've seen it. Or I've seen other websites that claim it's Tim Woods. Like, I don't know if it's apostrophe, like it belongs to Tim Woods. Or there's a bunch of different (laughs) Tim Woods that are, you know, uh, wasting people's time. But I'd say use whatever's comfortable, but I confess, I find downtime to be the elegant solution. Plus, Poor Tim Wood. Any any guy that's named Tim Wood, he's the poster child of waste. He is the poster child of the eight waste or seven waste. At I haven't least. met him yet, but if he's out there, I know this is probably bumming him out. <laughs> right, and and ultimately, it, there's good intent behind both acronyms, right? We're trying to use a technique, as many instructors do, to try to help students remember what the eight ways are. And if you don't like them, create one of your own. We'd love to hear yeah, it. Yeah, let's hear it. Or a new waste. Those are always fun. So up next, Tracy's interview with Brett Cooper, managing partner of Integris. Tracy, can you give us a little taste of what your upcoming interview is all about? Yes, I'm meeting with Brett Cooper, and he has been with Integris for about five years, but he's been in lean and process improvement in the industry for about 15 years. And really, we're going to be talking about everything else but the tools, 
when it comes to lean. So what we find often is most organizations will approach lean or process improvement by starting with training. And this is really more about all the other things organizations should be thinking about before they embark on a lean journey. I'm looking forward to it. Great taste, Tracy. Me too. Hey, Brett, how are you today? Doing great, Tracy. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining me in the Just In Time Cafe for a cup of coffee. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I uh, just, just so you know, since I am here in California, I do have my soy latte all ready to go. Nice. Of course, it has to be soy latte. Of course. That's healthy. Ab absolutely. I'm going to put some alfalfa sprouts on my burger later, too. <laughs> good. Well, let's move to a quieter room so we can talk about building a lean culture. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so before we launch into our conversation, let me tell our audience a little bit about our guest today, Brett Cooper. So Brett's a managing partner for Integris Performance Advisors for the last five years. And before that, Brett worked with Pivotal Resources for about 10 years alongside the owner, author, Pete Pandy, who wrote the book, The Six Sigma Way and the Field Guide Handbook. Integris is an organization that helps companies develop leaders, excellence in team performance and build operational excellence using continuous improvement principles of Lean Six Sigma. Integris has helped lots of different organizations build these skills including King County, LA County, Southern California Gas, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Comcast, and the great states of Washington and Arizona to name a few. That's pretty impressive. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Brett for at least 15 years working side by side, both at Pivotal Resources and Integris. So I actually know Brett pretty well. So just a little bit more about Brett. He lives in the San Francisco Bay Area and when he's not building great organizations, he's volunteering his time as a volunteer coordinator for the East Bay Stand Down. What is that about? Uh, the, the Stand Down program, I actually do two Stand Down programs up here, the East Bay Stand Down and the Stand Down on the Delta. We do them in opposite years. And essentially what these Stand Down programs are is we build a complete compound where we bring about 400 homeless or near homeless veterans into a uh, this encampment. And over the course of the four days, we serve them with medical help and dental help and legal help and job search. And more than anything, we're, we take these folks off the street and, and help them get back into a community. So it's a, it's an awesome program. I got involved with it for the first time in 2010 as a, a volunteer. A friend got me involved with it. I fell in love with it. And now I help coordinate the thing every year. Wow, that's really impressive. Um, that's a lot of work, too, isn't it? It is a lot of work. As a matter of fact, our next program is coming up next month. So we're right in the throes of it. So, so tell me, how did Integris get started? You know, it's a funny story. Uh, as, as you know, you and I were working together back in the early 2000s, working on Lean Six Sigma programs. This is back when uh, you know, Jack Welsh and GE were, were the poster child for, for Six Sigma and Lean Six Sigma. And, and we had clients coming up to us all the time saying, we want lean thinking to be part of the DNA of our organization. And as you know, largely the approach that we took back then was great. Let's do some some training. Let's create some black belts and some green belts, and let's do let's do some projects. Well, what happened with that is we we ended up doing a lot of of, of great improvement projects, but we really didn't make much movement on the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. So as we took a look at what those engagements were doing and what they weren't doing, it really dawned on us that we need to have a whole lot more focus on other more holistic areas of organizational excellence if we really want to have that DNA of the organization to change. And so it was with that that we launched Integris, uh, recognizing that we wanted to help organizations not just, quote unquote, do Lean Six Sigma, but really drive holistic change and do lean transformation and build a healthy organization. Right. So not just focusing on a tools approach anymore, but Correct. a transformation approach, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that tools approach was so ingrained in us uh, back in the, in the old days. And it was largely because you had leaders like Jack Welsh who, who were so strong and focused that they pushed this through. But the bottom line is most organizations didn't have that kind of leadership. And so the tools focus became, 
let's create some experts over here in the corner and have them go around the organization and fix things. And in many cases, that did exactly the opposite mm -hmm. of, of creating culture, right? It, it, it instead created these process improvement experts or process improvement warriors throughout the organizations that everybody else was looking at and saying, oh, stay out of my area, please. Right. Yes. I can see that too. And I'm, it's nice to hear that there are organizations like Integris out there helping with the culture piece, because I agree with you. I think the approach is different now. And, but the sad part is there are still many organizations that take a tools approach initially, right? You've probably talked to a lot of organizations at the start of some of their journeys and they want training. Is that right? We hear it all the time. We hear it all the time. And it's, you know, a lot of people, when they look, and or a lot of organizations, when they look at implementing Lean Six Sigma, they read old white papers, they read old books, and so much of that is about the green belt training and about the projects, right? It's about the value stream mapping and using the 5S and uh, doing the process walks. Most of those books and white papers don't really address the other kinds of issues around leadership and alignment and especially being focused on the customer. Right. Well, that's a great segue into what I should mention is Integris, especially you, Brett, was an author of a white paper called Achieving Lean Culture. It includes an implementation roadmap using the four, what you guys call the four pillars of operational excellence to build lean culture. So I'm really excited to make that available to our listeners. But before we get into the four pillars, what do you mean by lean culture? Well, I think the first thing that, that we should talk about is you know, what do we mean by culture in general? Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, culture is really about the group norms of behavior and the underlying values that allow an organization to keep those norms in place. So if we are thinking about lean culture, then we're gonna be talking about an organizational culture where the values and the behaviors are aligned with the principles of lean management. And if you think about lean management, then what are those principles? We're doing, we're, the, the entire goal around lean transformation, lean efforts, really is around delighting customers, engaging employees, and satisfying our stakeholders. And who wouldn't want that in their culture? Absolutely. You know, everybody wants it. The, the problem that, that I've seen and that our team has experienced time and time again is that organizations are so siloed that you have the continuous improvement group doing the lean efforts. Then you have the HR group doing the leadership efforts. Then you have the strategic planning group doing the cascading goals. And those silos persist throughout the organization and they end up creating silos in the organizational culture. Absolutely. And so now it's just checking the box with some of these action items as opposed to a transformation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So by by helping the cross section of the organization understand that when you're doing the continuous improvement work, you should also be looking and coordinating with the leadership work, for example, that brings those things together knocks down silos and really focuses more than on creating those norms of behavior and values rather than just trying to solve problems. Yes. You know, Tracy, to, to understand what the four pillars of operational excellence is all about, we really have to ask the question, you know, why do we do lean? And there's really three key reasons why we do lean. The first is we need to delight our customers, right? It's all about how do we do it better, faster, cheaper, or understanding whatever the requirements of our specific customers are all about. What are those requirements and how do we deliver against those so that they are satisfied, happy, and delighted? The second is really around engaging employees. It's about making it easier for employees to do their job so they can do what they are trained to do and what they love to do. As a matter of fact, uh, one of your previous just in time cafe podcast was with brian elms from the city of denver and he talked a lot about that i loved how he focused on that his job largely was around helping uh, the city police for example get their reports done quicker so they could be out helping people that was fabulous that's all about engaging employees and then the third piece of why we do lane is ultimately around satisfying stakeholders right because yes. when we reduce when we reduce waste when we make things more efficient, we improve the bottom line. And whether you're in a, uh, a for-profit company with actual stockholders or you're in a, a government organization with other kinds of stakeholders, if we can be more financially responsible 
everybody's going to be happy. So what I'm hearing really is everybody should be doing lean. And I'm really surprised that I, you know, lots of organizations still don't. Drives me crazy. And I'll tell you why. Because there are so many people that have had bad experiences with lean because people have used it incorrectly. I can't tell you how many organizations I still run into that think lean is an acronym. An acronym for less employees are needed. I know. Talk about a bad way to look at this. I know. It's painful. It is very painful. Well, I think what's really interesting about this white paper in particular is there really is a framework that you've outlined very nicely for people to get to to really apply building a lean culture. So let's talk a little bit about these four pillars of operational excellence that is mentioned. Sounds good. And I will start by saying that the framework itself is something that we think is really, really important. Now, whether an organization uses our framework or another framework, that's not really the most important thing. What I think is the most important thing is for an organization to have a stated framework, how they are going to go about evolving their organizational culture. Because by having a framework, you create a common language and it allows different parts of the organization to then talk about what it is you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So when we created the four pillars of operational excellence, that's exactly what we had in mind. So we have some organizations that we work with that use the the four pillars exactly as it is and others who take it and and adopt it and, and kind of tweak it in their own way. So tell us a little bit about this framework. What are the four pillars? Yeah, so the four pillars, uh, you know, of course, continuous improvement is one of those pillars. Uh, like, like I said, you know, when before we started Integris, that's the pillar that we entirely focused on, right? The, the continuous improvement pillar is where you work on your continuous improvement infra- infrastructure, you put together your project portfolio, and you do all of your your skills training, your project approach, things like that. But as we've been talking about, that in and of itself doesn't get to the culture. So the other three are really important. You know, the first thing that we look at is creating a common language around leadership and team interaction. We call that pillar the intentional culture pillar. It's again about stating how is it that we want leaders and team members to behave as they work together. The next pillar is really about getting clear all the way around the organization around things like mission, vision, values, top priorities. You know, a lot of organizations uh, will will create those mission, vision, values, top priorities in the back room, put them on their website. But when you ask people in the organization, hey, what are our mission, vision, values? Most people don't have any idea. So the, the, the next pillar yeah. We call it enterprise alignment. And that's really where we focus on those top priorities and make sure that all of those goals are cascaded down into the organization. And then the fourth and final and certainly not least is all around customer focus. And that's where we help organizations and in, in where the customer focus pillar is where everyone throughout the organization really understands that they're there to serve the customer. So it's about understanding who is the customer and what do they require? Our advice and, and my guidance to any organization would be to take a look at this framework and understand where are you today and start from there. Uh, you know, with those four pillars of being intentional culture, enterprise alignment, continuous improvement, and customer focus, there are a lot of organizations who have done a really great job on enterprise alignment, for example. You know, they've done a great job of cascading goals and they have their metric systems in place. And if that's the case, then you should be going right into making sure that your quarterly business reviews are uh, keeping track of, of what those metrics are telling you. But if those metrics don't exist, for example, then you really ought to think about putting a metric system in place so you can measure how performance is going. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you know, we talked about building a lean culture, and I think the framework can be really helpful for organizations. But I'm sure a lot of our listeners have an interest in knowing specifically what are some of the things that you see happening under the intentional culture pillar, which I really like the name of that intentional culture as just opposed to let's see what happens culture. Right. (laughs) I mean, that is really purposeful. Purposeful culture is really important. And sometimes if we don't pay attention to the culture and what we really want our culture to be, it just becomes whatever people make it, right? 
Exactly. I mean, the truth is that each of us are individuals. You know, we come from, you know, our own, uh, you know, our own towns, our own parents. We're taught different things. We're taught how to behave. And when you when you get a group of people in an organization together, if you leave it to every individual to say, this is how I think I should act as a leader and this is how I should act as a team member, then everybody's going to have their own definition of that. And what we find is that most people have some good ideas to bring to the table around those those kinds of concepts. But you need some kind of a framework, some kind of a model to align people around. Okay, this is what it means to be a leader in this organization or this is how we're going to work together as a team. Yes, that is really important. And, and then you can actually defend that, right? So exactly. sometimes people don't defend what they say. We're going to commit to this. And then when they see people not necessarily behaving that way, they don't correct it or they don't defend those things. So I think that's really interesting to say. It's intentional, it's purposeful, and that means that we have to defend it. Yeah, I'll give you an example of how this works. We had a client, as you know, Tracy, we have a client up in King County, Washington, who had been working on their lean efforts and had been trying to improve their their team dynamics just by you know trying to work better together. And their employee engagement survey back in 2015 showed that their employee engagement levels were very low and they weren't very happy about, about that fact. And so when they reached out to us, they, you know, they set the goal with us that said, we really want to address this employee engagement issue. So we worked with them using a framework that we call the five behaviors of a cohesive team, which is based on Patrick Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team which essentially helps a team work through these five behaviors of working together, which is around building trust, enabling healthy conflict, committing to decisions, holding each other accountable, and focusing on shared results. And over the course of a, of a year, we worked with the team using that framework to get ideas, get issues, get topics out on the table that they never talked about before, and when they took their employee engagement survey in 2016, they were blown away at the results. They had increases of 30, 33, up to 35% increases in their questions related to employee engagement and team spirit. Wow, that's impressive. And what yeah. I really think is impressive is you've, you have found a way, Integris has found a way to measure success. So culture is, you know, has a tendency to be something squishy that we can't measure. But it sounds to me like you guys have identified that employee engagement is a sign of a healthy culture, and often healthy cultures are lean cultures. And it sounds to me like some of your clients are having increases in employee engagement, and therefore the culture piece is working. That's exactly right. We really see employee engagement as a key metric of cultural evolution success. You know, if you look at all the research that's out there, you look at experts like Jim Cousins and Barry Posner, right? The authors of the Leadership Challenge. You look at the Gallup poll, you know, Towers Perrin. All of these organizations have done research on the impact of, of employee engagement. And the fact is that employee engagement leads to better customer service, lower turnover, better results, better process improvement, all of those things are impacted when employees are engaged at work. And we talk about engagement, we're talking about employees uh, essentially being willing to offer their discretionary effort for the good of the organization. So any organization that wants to improve culture and make it a, a more healthy environment, if you measure that employee engagement and see how connected to the organization people are, I think you're going to be pleased if you can make movement on those numbers. Definitely. And I can't believe we're out of time already. I could talk to you for hours, Brett. So is there anything else that you want listeners to know about Integris or about building a lean culture? You, you know, what I would say is that a great place to start is on that intentional culture. Start defining what leadership and team dynamics really is all about in your organization because when you get people talking about those kinds of things which really importantly are not things that we normally talk about right mm -hmm. i mean when you when when we do this kind of work we talk about personal values 
we talk about personal histories and we talk about personality styles. These aren't things that people will normally talk about. You know, I've never come into the office in the past and said, hey, so Tracy, tell me about your personal values today. It's just not things that people naturally talk about unless you have a little bit of a, um, I'll call it a contrived way to start talking about these things. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation to an organization that is trying to evolve culture and trying to make lean thinking really stick, start talking about leadership, team dynamics, personal values, those kinds of issues. And I think you're going to add a lot of power to your lean efforts. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you for that. And one last question. How would listeners get a hold of you? Are you on LinkedIn, Brett? I am on LinkedIn, and I love it when people connect with me. Uh, my LinkedIn name is Brett M. Cooper. I do have a M for Matthew in there. I'm also on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Brett underscore Integris. And a real easy way to find out more about us as an organization and, and specifically what we're focusing on now in this leadership and team development space is take a look at our kind of flagship URL, which is impactleadershipsummit.com. Well, thank you so much, Brett, for joining me today at the cafe. And I also want to thank our listeners for joining us on the Just In Time Cafe. I don't know. I don't think I need any more coffee today because I'm so excited about culture. How about you, Brett? <laughs> I am thrilled about it, Tracy. Thank you so much for having me today. This was a whole lot of fun. Okay. Bye for now, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Just In Time Cafe. Visit GoLeanSixSigma.com slash podcast to share your feedback or listen to more podcasts. Also, please subscribe to Just In Time Cafe on iTunes. Thank you.